Good evening, everybody. It's been a while. Kids never get this excited about Let me just take a look and see what's going on here with the audio. And let me start off by saying I'm sorry it's been a week. I was going to say it's been a week since I've streamed last, but it definitely feels like it has been longer. Um, I'm not quite getting any of my audio coming through, so... I'll just let you enjoy the sound of the Twitch advertisements while I wait to hear my, my voice. Alright. <clears throat> So yeah, it's been a while. Um, got some exciting news. Got some frightening prospects as far as the um, as my midterms went. But uh, I'm kind of in a little bit more of a holding pattern with school right now. Um, I don't need to worry so much about a big pile of homework. I still have a little bit of stuff that I need to do, but not... Nothing quite as dramatic as what I was encountering before. So even though I had a uh, kind of a career night that I wanted to get, well, I committed to going to and uh, wanted to, to sort of get done, um, I was able to get home early enough that I would want to get a bit of a stream in. So not quite sure. And by the way, sorry, I'm a little bit... Um, kind of zoned out from the day, so I'll try and get a little more peppy as far as the uh, dialogue is concerned. But uh, I did want to make sure that I did a uh, stream tonight because, as I've, I've said this a couple of times on the stream before, but uh, it's been nice to have people in the stream. It's really nice to have, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, to be missed. Uh, some people have definitely let me know that they want the stream back on, so and it's just something I really enjoy doing, so I definitely wanted to make sure that even if it was going to be a shorter stream than I had planned, that I wanted to get back on the track as far as uh, having a stream on Monday is concerned. And then just basically uh, sort of jumping back on the horse and uh, getting the stream done. Before I jump into Risk of Rain, which we're going to be doing tonight, I kind of wanted to do Crusader Kings, but I know if I do Crusader Kings, I'm going to be up a lot later than I intended. And there's a lot of stuff that happened uh, after the last broadcast, which actually was done offline, that I need to catch catch people up with. So I want to play something a little bit more um, action-ish, something that I could kind of leave at the end of the night. Um, there's also a couple of changes for the stream that are going to be coming up, as well as I've got a bunch of stuff that I want to do as far as extra games and stuff are concerned. i got a couple of classic games that I'd like to play on the stream, uh, which I'll be doing sometime this week. I definitely think we are about due to get back to Crusader Kings. There's some stuff that I want to accomplish as far as the kingdom is concerned. Just basically get back to the story of the House of Rose. And then what else do we have? A couple of games that I've got sort of planned and stuff I'd like to come back to. Darkest Dungeon is an example of a game that I really enjoyed playing and I thought worked well on the stream and uh, never got back to, and then some Besieged as well. But tonight we're going to do some Risk of Rain, so let me just take a minute here to load up the game. Uh, again, we're back into the uh, we're back into the mode where I'm just kind of trying to recover all of my old um, unlocks and saves from the uh, last time that I ran this game. So uh, in this case here, we've got a successful win on the mercenary and the or I guess the commando and the enforcer and we're going to be doing the bandit this time around now this is a hero that I actually have some trouble with um, mostly just because it's um, where the commando has like a definite dodge mechanic built into him so does the bandit but it's a little for lack of a better term it's less obvious so I think he's fantastic for putting out a lot of damage but uh, it's really easy to wind up just tanking enemies, and he's a pretty fragile hero, so. I know uh, I kind of do this a lot when I have uh, Risk of Rain streams. I sort of tend to repeat myself a little bit in terms of what I like about the game, but I think it's been a while since we played this, so I think it kind of bears mentioning in terms of why I've been really attracted to this game, why I keep returning to it. 
and sort of why I think it's a good example of where I think indie developers would do well to pay attention to. Well, other than the bug, which makes me fall over the edge. So let's try this again. Cirsca Rain is a game that's been made in, I believe it's called Game Maker Studio. Um, I think I might be getting the title a little bit wrong, but in any case, basically two college kids. Uh, I believe they, once they kind of knew they had a good game on their hands, they took it to Kickstarter. They uh, said what they wanted to do with the project. It's actually worth mentioning too, I tend to be really critical of a lot of, uh, never seen this game before? Uh, well, that's great, actually. Then I'll, I'll kind of explain the whole story behind it then. So, And welcome to the, the stream, by the way, uh, One King Stan. So um, the term roguelike gets thrown around a lot nowadays. Uh, but I actually think Risk of Rain gets a legitimate claim to the idea of roguelike for the following reasons. Uh, it's got a progression system. So the more times you play the game, the more items you unlock. You unlock item. There's an item that you unlock for dying too many times. There's an item that you unlock for uh, achieving certain feats as far as killing an enemy is concerned. So the game is sort of persistent in that sense that you you keep building and keep um, strengthening your your hero with new items as you play through the game. But the other mechanic that makes it, I think, qualify as a roguelike is uh, you do have only one life uh, if you perish before the final boss you have to go back from the very beginning and the whole purpose of this game is basically to take the preceding levels like the levels before the final boss and uh, just try and equip yourself for that final fight like if you were to go immediately to the final level the way you are right now uh, you'd be completely wiped out. There's no hope that you'd be able to get past it. But one thing that prevents you from just hanging around a level indefinitely and trying to scoop up as many items as you can from killing you know, enemies or something like that is the game's difficulty also increases the amount of time that you have inside of it. So you've kind of got these two competing uh, forces, which is one, uh, the fact that you do need to go around and make yourself stronger and sort of equip yourself for that final fight, but on the other hand, uh, you want to make sure that you go through the levels promptly. Otherwise, you're going to find that the enemies become too strong for you to handle. So uh, the way you complete a level is by clicking on that gate, which I did just there. You're going to be faced off with a final boss for that level. And uh, it basically spawns about a minute and a half worth of uh, enemies in here. So uh, there, are multiple play uh, there are multiple characters that you can play. I'm playing the character known as the Bandit who is uh, not exactly a glass cannon, but very close to it. A lot of his abilities tend to be oriented towards dodging rather than uh, tanking up damage, which I'm uh, actually doing right now. <laughs> but maybe uh, the particulars of this character I'll leave aside before I sort of explain what the game is. So. Effectively, you try and get through these levels as quickly as you can to get as many items as you can to deal with one final boss known as Providence. Uh, this game was made by a couple of college kids. I think they go to the University of Washington. Uh, made a Kickstarter for it. Kind of knew they had a good game on their hands. Told people what they wanted to do. And I think uh, as a bit of an example in terms of where developers could handle Kickstarter a little bit better, they did make some promises in the Kickstarter in terms of certain co-op or versus levels. And they came out uh, recently in an update and they said, it's like, listen, this is what we had promised for the Kickstarter. This is before we implemented. Uh, and then they listed a few different features and said, honestly, we think there's no real room for this feature anymore. Like, we don't think it's fun. And we think we sort of do what everybody wanted us to do with it in, you know, I haven't played the game enough to quite know what the original commitment was, but basically they, they pointed to the thing where they felt that they had sort of um, done the idea better. So rather than being slavish to this, you know, sort of, I guess, for lack of a better term, like, perfect game they had inside of their head, they, they dealt with the reality of the game. They dealt with what they thought would be fun and what they thought people would enjoy the most. 
and went with that instead. Then they just added a whole bunch of extra items into the game. Uh, you'll notice along the bottom of my screen, I've got four items right now. Each of them are just going to give me different abilities. None of these I'm too crazy about. Like that one I got was Prison Shackles, which will slow down the enemies. Uh, but there can be things that, you know, increase your health based on the number of kills and things like this. Uh, you do have to clear the, uh, the level of any enemies before you can move on, so I've got uh, 17 more to, to deal with. So, anyways, I kind of talked a little bit about the roguelike elements. You've got uh, permanent death, you've got this idea of sort of strengthening yourself for one big final fight, uh, the original rogue being a a big dragon that you needed to fight this being a, an alien creature that crashed your ship called Providence. And I think if you'd asked me, you know, could you do a roguelike as a platformer when, uh, you know, before I played this game, I would have told you no, uh, that they're two incompatible genres, but they actually did a really good job of this. Um, you know, the shooting part is fairly self-explanatory in that, but I think they just did this really good job of, like I said, keeping this tension between the amount of time that you need to spend in a level to strengthen yourself and the amount of time that you can spend in a level before the problems become insurmountable. Um, there's a degree of balance in here that I think is, uh, is really well done, especially considering the fact that uh, presumably this is the first game that this, uh, this pair ever made. Uh, based on the success of the Kickstarter, Chucklefish picked up this game. So uh, Chucklefish, probably better known for Starbound, for better or worse. And um, definitely, I think, have they've had more success with uh, Risk of Rain, in my opinion, than with, uh, with Starbound. So yeah, purpose of the game, run through the levels as quickly as you can, get the items that you need, and fight the final boss in a decent amount of time. Uh, this hero that I'm playing here, the bandit, every hero is going to have four different abilities. Uh, my primary ability is just a regular ordinary gun attack. It is a fairly rapid fire attack and it does do a fair amount of damage. Uh, they also say the limit is how quickly you can push the button. Now I don't think that's entirely accurate because there is an item known as a soldier's syringe which can increase your rate of fire. And I do notice that it will go faster even though I kind of hammer down on my Z button as rapidly as I can. Um, the next one is sort of a hand grenade, this thing over here. A uh, good area of effect damage, but a little bit slower on the cooldown. And just, I don't think it actually does as much damage as the, uh, as the gun. Uh, I suppose it, the question is, you know, based on how many hits. Um, I think for a single hit, the bomb probably does more damage than the gun, but the gun sort of has this nice rapid fire effect, which um, in practice is going to give uh, give me more damage. I don't actually mind using these uh, shrines early on, as long as I am sort of careful in terms of my health. Like right now, I'm at 174, so I'm not going to use the 170. Actually, now I can because I've got my uh, heart. So what I just want to do here is be careful about the monsters that I run into, but as long as I have the heart up, I should be able to sort of survive through uh, the refresh. And what that did was it gave me a pretty good um, cooldown item. It takes about 40 seconds for each spin. It is good for clearing big stacks of enemies and giving you some, uh, some gold to buy stuff with. So I talked about the first two abilities for the bandit. The third one is kind of unique. It makes him go invisible, so it takes any aggro off of you, and it also dodges attacks. I wish I was better at this skill. Uh, this is actually analogous to the commando, which is the default starting character, who has kind of this role. If you've ever played Dark Souls, it's really similar to that. You're immune to attacks while you're rolling. Um, but unfortunately, I don't seem to time the bandit quite as well, and the cooldown is longer on it. Now, one of the ways you get around the cooldown is you have your fourth ability, which is just this really high damage single shot called, uh, I think it's called Assassinate or something like that. Now, if you use it successfully, if you kill an enemy with it, you're going to get a, um, you're going to get all your cooldowns reset. So the idea here is that you time things out well so that you can use your strongest ability to finish off an opponent. And that will allow you to kind of spam your... It'll allow you to spam your, um, your invisibility 
At least as much as you need it. Uh, in practice, though, I'm never good at uh, at hitting either the dodge or the or the um, the assassinate at the right time. So I usually just try to manually dodge things like you're you're seeing here. Uh, the problem with this particular enemy is that if you fail to dodge it, you um, you wind up spawning wisps. Uh, wisps are those you've probably seen them, but I haven't really pointed them out. They're the little um, little flames that uh, well shoot flame at me. Um, the green ones are big wisps that are even nastier than their smaller counterparts. So this level is known as the Fungal Caverns. I don't think any player of this game likes it. Uh, it's just got a sort of a menagerie of enemies that are just not fun to deal with. Uh, you want to... Oh, and I just killed myself. <laughs> yeah, that was just me not paying attention to what was going on, so no explanation on that. We'll just move on to the next one. This is good. It just gives me a chance to go from the start, maybe be a little bit more efficient in my movements here. Um, yeah, maybe I think I'll talk a little bit about uh, just sort of game design and why I think this thing really did it well. Um, there's a lot of games coming around now which have pixel art. And it could be because the budget is too small or it could be because there isn't any anybody in the art department. But I think uh, Risk of Rain sort of comes about it honestly. And I think they actually did a really nice job of it. <laughs> hey, CPO Williams. Yes, I'm not dead. I, I actually... I was committing to uh, to make sure that I stream today no matter what. So, uh, it's Risk of Rain. I actually really wanted to do Crusader Kings 2 tonight, just because it's been so long since we've actually done it, but because I know I'm going to be up for like four hours if I play Crusader Kings 2, I thought I'd do something that uh, I die quickly in and, and can... Um, I guess I can walk away from without feeling too bad. Um, not that this is an unenjoyable game. I mean, like, honestly, I, there's so much replay that I keep getting out of, um, out of Risk of Rain. I think it's, it's just such a well done, well done game. Um, but yeah, I think one of the reasons why I like it the most is that you've got all of these tropes of indie games now, which are just sort of like, you, you're never sure if it's because they don't want to put the effort in or because it is legitimately, they're trying to stretch the budget as much as they can. Um... The art style, despite being very crude, for lack of a better term, uh, still has neat animations behind it. Uh, the, I think there's a little bit of character behind the monsters and the people you run into. Providence's motions are so unique and just really interesting to look at. It's actually one of the reasons why I sometimes get upset I don't get to the final boss as often as I'd like, uh, just simply because Providence is such a cool-looking character. Um, so even though it's pixel art, it's something that has a bit of a soul to it, as opposed to just kind of, we, you know, pixel art's easy to do, so we, uh, we went with that instead. Uh, again, the mechanics of the game are fairly simple. Uh, platform shooters are a pretty old genre. You can think of them, I mean, really back to, at a minimum, Nintendo? Probably earlier than Nintendo? I don't really know. I mean, this is ancient history <laughs> in some ways. Um, but just does this nice nice job of taking very well established, established genres. There's no shortage of indies that call themselves roguelikes and there's no shortage of platform shooters. And uh, this just winds up making something, something special. Something that's very much its own game. And again, so far as I can tell, the first time either of these authors made uh, made a game. Uh, actually, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the soundtrack to this game as well. Chris Christodoulou is the uh, creator for the, the soundtrack. Um, I mean, you can hear it yourself. I think this is a really nice atmospheric um, soundtrack. There is actually on SoundCloud there is his sort of commentary over the soundtrack, and he always keeps talking about these indulgent uh, guitar solos he puts in. Now, it's great because it still gives the game a lot of, uh, a lot of character. But um, especially for some of the, uh, the boss fights, I think uh, it's a really nice soundtrack. 
So goat hoof is an absolutely fantastic item to pick up. Uh, we now have one quarter goat. Um, basically movement speed, especially on a hero that's uh, not able to tank as much. Having that movement speed is something that'll win you a game. And in my opinion, the stuff that wins me games the most are uh, foreign fruits, which will allow you to get sort of a burst heal at, the, at uh, a time that you decide. Um... Soldier Syringe to increase my attack speed. So that's kind of the, the S uh, component of DPS. And uh, Infuser is also nice because if you get an Infuser early, you can use it to kill, like, all the enemies that you kill will increase your overall health. So a hero like the Bandit, who has a fairly low health pool, suddenly isn't as affected by by that. There are some other ones too, like there's uh, like a scarf which will decrease the amount of damage that you take and things like that. Uh, teddy bear called Tough Times, same deal. Um, there's definitely a lot of items that uh, will help you out, but... Oh sorry, it's Damp Caverns, not Fungal Caverns. But yeah, nobody likes this level. Um, so again, same idea here. I don't mind using these uh, low, these um, health sacrificing shrines as long as it's early in the level and I know I have some wriggle room as far as uh, getting away from enemies are concerned. Now everything is kind of procedurally generated and the monsters spawn randomly so there's really no way of telling whether or not stuff's going to be coming after you or not. But it's mostly just common sense. Like do you have wide open areas that you can sort of walk uh, walk around in? Uh, I actually, in some ways, prefer using health to money just simply because health is a renewable resource. So as long as you manage your character well, as long as, you know, you either dodge things or you have, you know, a high health regen or something like that, you're not hurting yourself that much by going and, uh, you know, and using some of those health-based shrines. Because that just gives you more gold that you can hang on to, um... I'm bad at this. Okay. That's just some... Uh, sorry, that's more gold that you can use uh, a little bit later on. Generally, the further you go in the game, the more costly the chests. So being able to get one or two extra items uh, in exchange for health that you may not necessarily need at that moment is a pretty good deal. Uh, the item that I specifically bought there instead of opening the chest was um, it's basically an egg which uh, ensures that as long as I'm out of combat, I'm going to regen faster. So in that case, that was sort of in response to what I had done with the... Uh, that was in response to what I had done with the, um, the health shrine. Basically something to push up my healing as quickly as I could. And this is the infusion. So basically now, that, uh, now when I kill enemies, I'm going to be getting a little bit of health. This is... Definitely, we're not at the point where we can say that this is a game-winning run, but we're, we've got all the things that we need, or at least we're shaping up to a point where we're getting a lot of the stuff that we need to, to go really far in this round. Um, I do have a kind of a nasty stack that I need to deal with. I need to be really careful that I don't take uh, too much damage all at once. And it's not getting any easier, unfortunately. The best thing that can happen to me right now, actually... Oh, what? Well, actually, these things still help. Uh, if I drop a banner like this because my attack speed goes up that much faster... Oh, I just died. Yeah, that was me being careless again. Um, but yeah, so like the ideal there is that you can use the banner to kill the enemies before you... Before they get on top of you. But Obviously... I'm out of practice with this. So, back to the Desolate Forest. I should note, um, at least as far as the PC version is concerned, except for the new characters introduced in the latest update, so that's two new characters, I've actually beaten the game with each of the, each of the characters. So, I would normally play this game on Monsoon, save for the fact that one, I'm rusty, and two, more importantly, I am trying to get all of my unlocks again. So, I think it's a little bit easier just to play it on normal and uh, try and get as many unlocks as I can.
Oh my goodness, Jesse Quill. I didn't even notice that you hosted... You actually hosted me quite some time ago, it looks like. So, if you're in the channel, thank you so much for doing so. If you're not in the channel, and you happen to be seeing the VOD, same deal. And I was actually going to take a minute to ask everybody how they're doing. I know the thing I was sort of dreading... Um, I try not to obsess too much over viewer numbers. But... Um, I do know an extended absence sort of translates to needing to rebuild the audience again, but uh, wanted to take a minute and just ask chat, how are you guys doing? And what have you been up to while I've been suffering in the salt mines of academia? This is the problem I run into on the um, bandit, is that instead of just dodging those attacks, I um, I just kind of wind up tanking them with my face and then wonder why I die. Actually, I was gonna save this stuff for the first proper stream that I do, but seeing as I got a couple people in here, I'll talk a little bit about some of the plans I've got coming up for this stream. So, the last time I streamed, there was a bit of a conversation in terms of, you know, how I think streamers would do a better job of um, not, you know, not playing the modest card when it comes to. Uh, donations and things like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to solicit donations, but they shouldn't feel bad about uh, getting donations. There's definitely a culture. I was actually talking with um, W. Shand about this. Um, there's definitely a culture that seems to say, you know, oh, you're not actually doing it for love of the games if you're you're accepting money. I really don't agree with that sentiment. Um, there's a lot of streamers that I really enjoy watching who are able to make a living doing this and they very clearly enjoy what they're doing uh, and I mean they're getting paid for it and I think more importantly they deserve to get paid for it because they really are providing you know providing service providing entertainment so based on that conversation and again it's not to put me in that exalted company uh, but I did look to um, I did look into getting a donation button which I've not added onto the page yet um, but I've got a working solution. Freighter 5, how is it going? It's a long time no see. That is entirely my fault. I hope you've been well. But yeah. Um, one of the things that I have done and not implemented yet, but will be coming soon, is the donation button. You're so tired. I hear you on that. Yeah, so, um, it's something I'm going to try out. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do for things like the donation button was to actually make sure I had sort of a little bit of channel infrastructure in place for it. Now, an unfortunate reality of the Mac version of OBS is that it's still in a very early beta and all of the features that I am accustomed to on the PC version are not available in the um, not available in the Mac version. So a really important one for me is chroma keying. Um, that is one of the reasons why even if I did own a green screen I wouldn't actually be able to do a face cam because there isn't a way to key out the green background. Um, likewise, the I had some ideas in terms of like things like um, follow notifications, uh, hosting notifications, um, you know, donation notifications, and things like that. I can play sounds, um, but any images on the screen uh, require uh, chroma keying. 
And because Chroma Keying isn't available inside the Mac version of OBS, it's uh, a little bit like my, you know, my direct uh, contribution to the stream, which is uh, the audio only. So I still think I, th I still think it's worth uh, putting up, mostly because uh, donations will never ever be solicited. They will always be appreciated. Um, and I'm actually going to talk when I I formally announce it. I'm going to talk a little bit in terms of how I make sure that that is stuff that's going towards the stream. Um, and just making sure that that is. You know, I'm, I'm basically being a good steward of anything that that generates because um, I don't actually expect it to be a whole lot. But uh, I think based off of a couple of conversations that I had, people said that that's something I should finally, finally implement. Uh, but basically, I am at the mercy now of OBS as far as the next major set of upgrades that I want to do to the stream. Uh, which is fine because I think the uh, the next important thing to do is to find creative ways to get around it to make it fun for people. Uh, the biggest regret that I have is I would really like people to have some visual recognition of the contribution that they are making. So I'm working on some ideas on that which don't involve um, don't involve the cr chroma key uh, solution, but. I'll be honest, I haven't come up with something that I'm 100% happy with. A lot of it usually winds up uh, taking screen space away from from the games. Uh, and I think that's especially problematic if I start playing more complicated games like um, Crusader Kings or Democracy 3 or something like that. So that'll be a bit of a work in progress. Um, in terms of other things coming up, I've got some new games I'm actually going to be trying out probably this week, actually. Akakadak! Yes, Risk of Rain. And really happy to see you. I know I got a chance to see you earlier today in Yipstream. I'm actually really sucking at Risk of Rain right now, but... Uh, it's a nice one to unwind. It doesn't require a whole lot of... Uh, it doesn't require as much of a time investment as uh, as some of the others. Um, in terms of other changes to the channel as well, I've done a really bad job of announcing um, this bit of news and I have a feeling I'm probably going to wind up announcing it a couple of times just because I know there's going to be a, a little bit of a teething period where I sort of need to rebuild the regular audience again. Well, not rebuild, but basically just let people know that I'm not dead and, um, you know, and that the schedule is back on track. But, uh, you never actually played it, but it always seemed like a good game just to kick back and enjoy. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a game that you can definitely take very seriously, but, um, like, there have been times that I've taken Risk of Rain when I'm, like, on a bus or something like that, don't have anything better to do, uh, and I've been able to get through a round of it. Um, but yeah, anyways, so I've done a really bad job of, uh, of sort of making this announcement, but um, for those of you who didn't know already, I've gotten two acceptance letters for grad school. Uh, one is for the University of Victoria, which... People seem to, you know, kind of nod their heads and, you know, kind of the good school reaction. Um, but I'll be honest with you, it was one of my safety schools. Um, but the day after that, I got a letter from the University of Western Ontario, which is one of the top four economics departments in Canada. Uh, not only was I accepted into that program, but uh, they will pay the tuition, there's financial support, there's a TAing position for me, um, uh, kind of a chancellor's entrance scholarship, uh, and then that would be on top of, you know, whatever, well, maybe not on top of, they, they do sort of tailor the package if you wind up getting like a regular scholarship, but basically school is, if I wind up going to Western, uh, school is taken care of, nice prestigious, well, for Canada. Uh, program. I did apply to the other, like, to the three schools that outrank it, so it's not guaranteed that I will be going to that school, but it's 
a very nice floor as far as my potential schools are concerned. Um, now what that means for the stream, um, this program is known as a PhD stream. Yeah, thank you, Akakadak. Um, it's a PhD stream master's program. So as long as I get a certain grade in, um, in the master's program, I get automatic entrance into their PhD program. Um, whether or not I would actually do a PhD there or PhD at all is a totally different question. Uh, my intention for doing an MA was actually so that I could kind of prove myself in a in a more rigorous kind of course and then go to sort of a, a top choice kind of an institution like MIT or London School of Economics or something like that. Black Dahlia. Holy crap, Black Dahlia! <laughs> Gentlemen, we're being raided by Black Dahlia and Jesse Quill. Oh my goodness. Black Dahlia, I believe you are the first one to formally raid me. Jesse Quill has hosted me a couple of times, but I'm getting... I'm getting uh, so much joy watching all the, uh, the Dahlia sending their salt, sending their regards. Uh, I'm probably going to wind up dying if I do this, but Black Dahlia 1147, thank you for coming in. For... For Gonorain... Okay, you know what? I'm pausing. For Gonorain... Bloodglade, Lady Ray 11, the Vertrexlius, wow, um, Ketamalir, you know what, I'm sorry guys, I, I'm terrible at pronouncing these names, thank you every single one of you for stopping by, and this is a man who probably doesn't need an introduction on this stream, but I'm gonna do it anyway, Black Dahlia is one of the people on Team Panda who has really gone above and beyond to promote this stream, it's actually I was talking about this whole idea about how much time I spent away and how it's going to take me some time to sort of rebuild the uh, Katie Maria Baker. <laughs> um, you know, it's just talking about the time it's going to take to sort of get a, you know, the audience that we, we had before I went on hiatus. And uh, tonight we've got more than we're, we're used to. So, um Again, I've got one man to thank for that. Um, Black Dahlia's stream is tremendously fun to watch. Uh, the last I saw him, he was playing Mass Effect, but I know he's switched into other things. I believe it was WoW, if I wasn't mistaken. Um, but uh, we were actually talking, too, about uh, signing up for Twitch alerts and sort of the frustration I was having with the fact that I can't chroma key. Um, he does this absolutely wonderful raid response, which... Um, you know, now I suppose I'm going to need to get used to a world of raiding as well. Um, but yeah, the fact that he was doing it was one of the things that sort of inspired me to take things like Twitch alerts a little bit, or not, uh, yeah, Twitch alerts a little bit more silly, seriously. And uh, I don't know, try and steal some of some of the magic that he brings to his stream. So if you haven't checked him out, if um, I don't actually have any formal mods, but uh, if Black Dahlia is uh, modest enough that he won't link himself. If somebody is so inclined, if you want, you can obviously just click on his name to get it, but uh, if you have not done so already, please check out his channel, give him a follow. He is absolutely a friend of this stream and somebody who I've had a lot of fun watching myself. Katie Marie Baker, uh, I will say that I always... Uh, play around with the Dahlia, the Dahlia send their regards myself. Thank you so much, Lady Ray. So I strongly encourage all of you, if you've not done so already, to give that link a click. He's somebody you'll probably see hosted uh, if he's streaming and I happen to be near a, an internet connection to support that. But yeah. Black Dahlia actually does a much better job of uh, introducing people as well. I'm focusing on not dying, so he kind of got the half-assed version, but in my defense, I did just come from a career night, so... <laughs> well, Katie Mar Marie Baker, I think what you need to do is you need to wait till he's playing a frightening game, and you need to unfollow and then follow again, just so you can get the... Uh, the jump scares in.
All right, I'm boned. Oh, and Black Dahlia is pimping me out on Twitter as well. You are absolutely right. I am only a few followers away from my first 100. I don't know what to say, man. I absolutely appreciate you doing this for the stream. I definitely need to get back in the saddle as far as all this stuff is concerned. This is a... A much warmer welcome than I ever could have expected. So, uh, to all the regulars coming in, you guys know that you make the stream for me. You are the reason why I've been able to continue doing this and even even looked into joining something like uh, Team Panda. Dahlia and everybody in his channel, uh, thank you so much for making me uh, making me feel like I'm I'm back home on my uh, first stream back from a extended period of homework. <laughs> if they ever finally get the Mac port for um, Outlast in, I think that would be a good time to turn on the sounds for the follows. I think the worst thing about the OBS uh, lacking chroma key um, story is just that they they've actually acknowledged that this is a fairly major feature that needs to be implemented and they've they've more or less said we really don't know when it's actually coming in so it means that i mean it's a it's a nice place to be right where you can say that um your you know your plans are now constrained by the technology rather than like not having any good ideas but um but with that in mind, like it's still it's still such a shame that I can't do something like uh, like a nice follow um, animation because I've actually got a couple of things for them. By the way, guys, I'm really sorry about following chat. Um, I've died a few times in um, Risk of Rain already, so I'm a little bit gun shy and I'm only catching a bit of chat just because my monitors are all in weird places. I really appreciate that, Black Dahlia. I actually have, um, there is something I might hit you up for in terms of, uh, adjusting one clip, but the, the challenge I have actually is that, um, I, I think you use Twitch alerts. So you know how there's like this big green, um, screen that you chroma key out so that you can have the rest of your game over it? Sounds like something a filthy casual would say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm below casual at this point. I've had two embarrassing deaths tonight already. Um, but yeah, the so you'll probably, like, I think you know what the Twitch alert screen looks like, even if you don't use it. But the, um, the big problem that I have is that there's no chroma key option on uh, Mac OBS. So even, like, even with the stuff that I want to do, um, you use CLR browser instead of the window. Ah, okay. That might actually be something that solves this problem then. But yeah, basically any, solu any solution that requires me to key something out, I'm basically at the whims of the OBS team for them to implement that into the, into the clients. And I mean, they still haven't actually put in audio capture. I still need to use this uh, fairly questionable um, third-party solution, which tends to desync my audio. Alright, I'm definitely going to have to look into that then, because I was really bummed out that I wasn't going to be able to have all those follower uh, animations. Yeah, no problem. You have my permission to go to the bathroom, Black Dahlia. <laughs> I expect a full report when you come back. So, um, for the, oh, 
Your alerts are really messed up, but you gave up and said, ah, it's not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, if there's one thing that I can do well, it's mediocrity. So I have a feeling that <laughs> once I get something in place, I'll be able to, to justify it after the fact. So I'm actually a little bit curious because I spent a lot of time at the beginning sort of talking about this game and uh, and why I liked it, but just a straw poll of those who are sort of active in chat right now. How many of you are familiar with Risk of Rain or own it yourselves? Never heard of it. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm actually really surprised that this uh, game isn't better known. Um, welcome back, Dahlia. I hope you feel like a new man. But yeah, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the title, it is basically an action platformer roguelike. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this game so much is that it is one of the indie games that takes the roguelike title and actually has a legitimate claim to it. It's a game that you spend uh, several procedurally generated levels uh, building up your strength to face kind of the big final boss. Yep, how's it going? My god, there's a lot of you people. I'm really sorry for all the people who I'm not uh, noticing in chat, by the way. That's, uh, as Dahlia pointed out, I'm in full casual mode tonight. And uh, trying to focus on the, the game a little bit more because I keep dying. <laughs> but yeah, basically, um, I think this game has a little bit more of a claim to... I am going to die has a good claim to the roguelike title because it's not just permanent death that gives it the roguelike elements, but it's actually this idea of progression um, through several playthroughs that uh, that helps you out. The idea that you're building yourself up for the big final boss fight. Alright, how am I going to get out of this? I think I'm actually just going to run around for the 90 seconds and slowly pick apart the enemies one one at a time. Awesome, yep. This is one, if you if you like playing this, uh, this is one that we can maybe try doing uh, co-op sometime. Yeah, it is a tricky game. Uh, one of the things I'll say too is, I was talking about this earlier on, about the uh, pixel art for the game. So a lot of games seem to use pixel art just because it's a really in, inexpensive way of uh, getting an art program. But one of the things I really like about Risk of Rain is it, like... Even though it's pixel art, there's a lot of character behind it, especially the final boss, uh, Providence. Uh, his animation just looks so cool. Never resist a full system wipe. I think a full system wipe is uh, going to be the name of this broadcast if I don't get my health up. Yeah, my god, it's. I think we've kind of got a reunion of... Well, not a, not, not a reunion, but... Uh, unif I think we've got Quorum on Team Panda in the, uh, in the chat tonight. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, Jesse, um, Yip was one of the first to know about the grad school news, and he pointed out that apparently I'm trolling that much more since I got the news. I think I've always been trolling um, the way that I do, and it just so happens that Yip has been around um, to actually witness those events. I've established a false reputation for being nice. I think Dahlia's probably seen more of my trolling, actually. So... Kind of what we're experiencing here is one of the reasons why I'm not good at the, uh... <laughs> Bet 
Best slow troll NA. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, not a problem, Black Deli. Thank you so much for stopping by, and obviously thank you so much for the host. Uh, that was so, so welcome. Um, but what was happening on that platform, there's a fairly good example about why I'm not good at the bandit. You can see it, your genius is frightening. I don't know about that. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks, yep. But yeah, basically, um, you take quizzes online that tell you you should have a master's degree to feel smart. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things to have happen, actually. So I grew up in a church growing, sorry, church growing, church going household. And so one of the unfortunate features of Facebook for me is that there will be a lot of like family members or acquaintances of the family uh, come on. And obviously there's a lot of these people who are kind of associated with the church and, you know, just have a very different set of priorities from me. Katie Murphy, uh, you'll have to head out, which is weird because it's only 11.30 a.m. Have an amazing rest of the stream seeing me in the future. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by, Katie Marie Baker. I hope you have a great sleep and... Uh, this was a brief meeting, but I actually really like it when people come in and they're so active in chat right away. So we're absolutely lucky to have you in it and hopefully to see you again soon. But yeah, anyways, Zach Akadek, so, or well, to everybody. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar kind of with the social pressure, right? You can't really not add them to the list because that's just going to cause a whole bunch of you know, it's just going to cause a whole bunch of drama on its own, but you don't actually want to have to hear what these people say. Um, and I notice a lot of these people from the church keep posting these IQ tests, and they all keep giving, like, 150, 160 results. So it's like, okay, so let me get this straight. It's like, this... Co um, I can limit their vis visibility, yes. Um, I'm also very lazy on Facebook. Honestly, like, I don't like doing the unfollow stuff. I generally just cast people into the lake of fire. Um, I usually just delete them if they become sufficiently annoying. Um, but yeah, in this particular case here, I finally decided to do an accounting of, uh, all these IQ tests, which had, like, 150, 160 results. And basically, apparently this cohort of, you know, 60 and 70 year olds from a Salvation Army in Kelowna, my hometown, um, are like greater geniuses than Alexander Hamilton and, you know, Ben Franklin and all these, like, the greatest geniuses of history apparently have all congregated in this uh, small town Salvation Army. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't think they quite appreciated the, um, the tone of the reply, but didn't need to worry about any more IQ tests, so I suppose there's a benefit there. So again, this is the big problem I have with the... Um, Bandit, which is as soon as there's just giant stacks, uh, I tend to die pretty quickly, so I'm slowly starting to learn how to handle it. Did I throw in a Kappa? Maybe they'll understand. Yeah. I think more pla I think Kappa is, at, is to a point now we actually need to have it on more social media platforms. Hashtag Kappa just isn't doing it for me. The worst thing for me, actually, is I'll usually say a lot of sarcastic stuff and forget to add the kappa, so I'm sometimes wondering whether or not people think I'm just a dick. Which is actually also true, but... Oh god! <laughs> Go hang out with your master degree brethren at Goodwill, yeah.
Cap is cat protect your dick. <laughs> All right, this is kind of a cheesy strategy. I don't actually know why the Colossus can't go past that point, but I'm happy it can. This is definitely a lot longer than I want to ever take on a level like this, but we're near the end now, so. I actually got a fairly good haul. That's a lot of damage I'm taking, come on. There we go. Now I'm not crazy about drones, but... Seeing as I'm kind of at the end of this level, I'm just going to spend as much money as I can. Uh, I don't know if you missed it, but DOS just got a thousand times harder. Oh, Divinity Original Sin. Oh, by the way, yep, I absolutely loved your trips to the brothel this morning. That... Definitely made my study session. Alright, uh, one thing I'll say about this level is I normally check the bottom for it. Now, it turns out that the portal is just above, but... I think most of the times I've done this level... I've always wound up just searching the thing high and low, and inevitably there's a a gate on this bottom level. So I've just gotten in the habit now of checking it out before uh, I go any further. This level can also be a bit of a pain in the ass just because there are flying Lemurians. And uh, they tend to stack and swarm you and just generally be a massive pain. So I'm going to try and open that gate as soon as I can and let the drone just slowly do some damage on those things. You paid Ruby to date a troll? <laughs> what, your ranger wanted the job? Is that why they were jealous? So one thing I'll say about this particular level, um, the Imp Overlord is not a particularly difficult enemy to fight. Uh, what is difficult, though, is the collection of monsters. So this is one where it's actually worth uh, holding back for the 90 seconds, you know, dealing with a swarm of flying beasties, and then uh, turning around and just cleaning everything else up. Um, one really nice advantage is that I got the Sacrificial da Dagger on the previous level, so now once I start encountering those stacks, um, the death of an enemy is actually going to result in more projectiles coming out to kill enemies. So there's sort of this uh, virtuous cycle that can develop uh, as long as I don't get too far over my head. As you can see, I'm taking a little bit of damage, but nothing to start crying about yet. The biggest thing you want to do here is just avoid having those uh, flying creatures swarm you. As long as you can do that, you're generally okay in this level. And the Sacrificial Dagger is absolutely something that helps out with this. This is actually a perfect example of the sort of thing that you want to be able to, or that you uh, want a sacrificial dagger for, because once this wisp is down, there's just going to be this big stack of, uh, I think they're called parents, 
Um, they're not able to get out of that hole. Well, they can, but their current positioning doesn't really give them the intelligence to get out of that hole. So now it's basically just a matter of doing as much damage as I can to them. And once one of them falls, the rest are going to fall. And there's just going to be a whole bunch of damage that goes flying across the map to the left-hand side. Again, same idea, nice stack is basically just immediately finishing everything off for me. Imp Overlord is not a trivial enemy by any means. Uh, I should say the fact that he can teleport right away, um, it's definitely his mobility is the biggest thing to deal with. Um, but if he ever gets on top of you, uh, usually you can solve that just by going invisible. So basically here it's just kind of clean up crew now. Alright, yep, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, and uh, by the way, I wanted to just take a minute and say your streams have actually been a lot of fun to watch recently. Well, they've always been fun to watch, but um, especially when I've been neglecting my studies, uh, they've kind of got me through... through periods of extended boredom, so thank you for being awesome at what you do. Again, picking up another drone just because I've got 2,000 uh, whatever the currency is, I'll say $2,000. Um, there's no way I'm going to be able to spend all of it, so I might as well. You do get experience for anything that you leave over, but honestly, experience is not worth as much as just getting something that can do some sustained damage. Eh, gasoline's okay. Gasoline's nice for dealing with big stacks, which I seem to have been running into, so... The biggest thing I'm concerned about is I'm already 36 minutes into this run, which is definitely pretty slow for uh, a run of this nature. But we do have some reasonably good... We actually were a little shallow on items, but not overwhelmingly so. So this could be a run where we do things. Jetpacks... I'm a lot, definitely in this game, I tend to like a lot of mobility items. So jetpacks, ghost, goat hoofs, um, being able to get, you know, soldiers' syringes and increase your rate of fire. All of these things are absolutely fantastic, especially for somebody like the Bandit, because they just do so much damage on their own. Oh, what am I doing? I love this level so much, I don't want to go to the gate. All right. Okay, so Temple of the Elders is the last level before the um, before you get the option of uh, teleporting to the final level. So if I was smart, I would actually be saving up these containers to uh, I'd be saving up these containers uh, so I can do damage to the creatures once there's a lot of them. But uh, it's possible I may not want to come back this way, so figure I'll get the efficiencies that I can here and then just rely on my usual attacks to carry me through the day. Yeah, um, the default hero, the commando, is actually the best example of how mobility will help you out because their, their dodge has a much lower cooldown than in the case of the uh, bandit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just immediately going to start the counter because, again, it's another batch of flying creatures that I don't want to deal with. Imp Overlord I'm not too worried about. I'm going to take advantage of the war banner here. I am going to take a pretty hefty amount of damage, but I can just immediately run away and heal up after that. We got him down to about half health that way, so it's a sa it's a, not a sacrifice. It's a trade-off I'm willing to make as long as I'm able to sort of dodge this next batch of creatures.
Biggest problem with these ones is that if they hit me, uh, it slows me down, so... Oh, this could be it, actually. Let's see if we can pull out a, an impressive win. Well, this is gonna be a problem. Oh, no. Yeah, dead. Ah, uh, that's a shame. All right, I'm at the one hour mark and I think a little bit of the activity has sort of calmed down a little bit. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my first and probably only break for the evening. Um, it's just three minutes so I can fill up a glass of water, get a stretch and just generally kind of clear out some of the, the fuzz and the cobwebs. Uh, I might do some more Risk of Rain afterwards. I actually had, um, I had a classic that I was sort of sitting on, um, kind of waiting for some of the regulars to come in, but now that I see there's a few people in here, I think I might actually switch to this other, uh, to this other game, uh, because it's a fun one. But, uh, tell you what, we'll figure that out after I'm done my break. I'll ask, uh, three minutes of your time just so I can get up, stretch, and, uh, get ready for the next round. I'll encourage you guys to do the same, and we'll be back for more of something. See you guys in a bit. All right, thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, I think I am going to change it up a little bit. I'd really like to do a little bit more Risk of Rain because I actually feel like I'm getting a little bit better at the uh, at the Bandit, but not quite enough to sort of sustain the progress that I've made. <clears throat> but I think it's time to change things up a little bit. I've been wanting to play this on... Uh... I've been wanting to play this on the the stream once I saw it. Like this thing was on such a ridiculous to sale. I think I got it for like two bucks. And um, this is definitely something I I knew I wanted to put on stream. So just let me set it up. Ah, now, this is a small problem. Okay. Looks like they chose to put this in a particularly stream unfriendly format. So what I think we will do Oh, by the way, yep, uh, if you're still around, yes, let's co-op sometime. I just read that message. Okay. 
Not to worry. Uh, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to grab a mobile device so I can read chat. And I'm just going to switch to display capture, which should get this fixed. Yeah, it's not pretty. Sorry about that, guys. Guess you know the game now, though. Okay, uh, I'm just going to get up for a second so I can uh, give myself a chat alternative. Still trying to set it up. I haven't been able to read chat since this game opened, so sorry folks, I'll just be with you in one more minute. Okay, looks like the video sucks. Let's see if I can change that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and as you can kind of see from the screen here, right, like it doesn't give me it doesn't really give me any options in terms of like capturing a um or like in terms of like maximizing the the resolution or something like that um it's another way i can get around this i won't spend too much more time um messing around with this i'll i'll just find and i should have tested this before i did this on stream actually um I can't do window capture because it won't let me alt tab out after the fact. You know what? I'm out of ideas. Sorry. Um, we're canceling Rise of the Triad tonight, um, but I am going to find out a way to get this done. So now I guess I need to figure out what else to do for the rest of the night. I have an idea, actually. So I don't expect anybody to have this game. But if you want a more complicated version of Hearthstone... Let's give this game a try. It's actually been a really long time since I played this, so. Hmm. 
Wasn't that a pain? All right, maybe if I log in, I'll be able to get the um, aspect ratio where I want it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to introducing it. Just I'm apparently spending too much time getting it all set up. Yeah, I did. I played a bit of Magic uh, back in the day. I have a copy of Magic on my um, on my PC. Uh, I think this is definitely like there aren't, in my opinion, there aren't a lot of sort of digital CCGs, um, and I think this is very much its own game, and it's it's good as a result. Like Hearthstone is a lot of fun to play. Hearthstone is quite straightforward, a little simple, and simple is not a bad thing. Uh, Infinity Wars has some really interesting mechanics behind it. I think it's a little bit more complicated than Hearthstone, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. Um, but I think they are two games that you can enjoy equally for different reasons. All right. So you get free cards for logging in too, so it's definitely a pretty friendly game as far as its free-to-play model. Um, let me just take a look at my settings and see if I can... Um, well, I'm not crazy about it, to be honest. Oh, actually, this is a problem. Hmm. Yeah, this is... I need to switch it between my monitors to actually get the full effect. Okay, what happens if I go full screen? I swear we will play at least one other game before the end of the night. Oh no. Okay. Something's bugged out. Let's try that again. No, no, that's too large. All right, there we go, finally. Okay, so after all of that, basically this is another Kickstarter game. No. Um, this is another Kickstarter game. I believe this is from Australia. Now, the thing that makes this game fun and unique... You have a ton of magic cards that you play with? Um, thanks for hanging out, by the way. I know this is not the, uh, I know watching me set up or fail to set up games is not the most compelling viewing material. Um, basically, oh, let me just take a look here. Had a few regulars stop by, and it looks like they vanished. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. I don't know if they just kind of went off on their own or if I missed a goodbye. All right. Anyways, while we're waiting for this to load, so this is Kickstarted Australian game. Um, the thing that makes this game unique and interesting is that it is actually 
Um, like it's simultaneous turns. So there is a mechanic to say that if there is absolutely something that needs to be done at the same time, um, then like it'll make a decision. But generally the idea about this game is that, you know, in magic, like the whole idea is get the 20 points down to zero first or hearthstone. Um, in this game, if you both take the other guy's fortress down to zero, it's a draw. Um, I think it's probably better. Uh, it's probably better if I just show you guys, but I, I will say this is completely free to play. Um, the tutorial system is the last I saw it is generally okay. The, the formal tutorials are not that great. Um, but the, uh, they have like this campaign that you can play through. And, uh, the campaign is actually a really great way to learn the game. So, um, I encourage you guys to come in. Uh, I'd love to play some of you guys on stream if you'd like. You do not need to worry about giving a code, but I will, if you want to give me credit for recruiting you, here is my code. It does not actually do anything unless you spend money in the game. So it's not the end of the world if you don't use that code, but F-C-E-D-F if you want to sign up and give it a try. If you don't want to remember the code, that's fine. Just sign up and I'd love to play you guys with this. But uh, on the odd chance that you guys decide not to to download it or it takes too long, um, I'm going to do... Oops. Uh, this is the campaign. I've already done the campaign, and I don't actually want to do spoilers for some of the puzzles. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go against a succession of AI opponents, starting with Puffy the Goldfish. And... What deck do I want to use? I actually have a favorite um, clap faction. So actually I should explain that there's different factions inside this game. It's probably better that I just show them as they go along. I just need to find one that's relatively straightforward to... Oh, you know what? Flame Dawn's a good starter one. Okay, so you start off with a game, you've, you've got two sort of health indicators. Uh, you've got health, which is the health of your fortress. If that goes down to zero, you lose. Uh, that is basically the same as life in any other of these card games. You'll send people into the assault zone to, to do the damage. Uh, you also have morale, though. So your morale uh, can also lose you the game. Morale generally uh, is lost when you... Uh, when a character dies. So a good example of this would be you've got the Flame Dawn Aspirant. So this is this costs one resource. I currently only have one resource. Uh, this is the morale cost. So if this unit dies, I lose three morale. There are also cards that do direct morale damage. There are other events that can cause morale uh, damage as well. So there's actually two different ways to de defeat an opponent. And different factions are going to have different uh, strategies. The Flame Dawn is a very physical damage based kind of um, faction. You want to hit them hard and you want to hit them early and you just do not want to let up. Uh, as is the case with a lot of these kinds of games, uh, there's special kind of special abilities. So this one has charge, which means that it will automatically move to the assault zone when it's played. You'll notice it only costs one, and then it has uh, four damage, two health. So basically, this is four damage that you put directly into the assault zone for one um, one resource. That's kind of an indication of, uh, of where the priorities are. Now, some things that will make this game a little bit different from, let's say, magic or something like that. You have the command zone. So these are sort of, they're technically in play right now. Uh, you can move them from the command zone by paying the cost for playing them. And then you can choose to put them in the defense zone, the assault zone, or the support zone. Now, if they have an ability that you can use, so it's like, you know, pay one to heal for two, uh, two health or something like that, because they're in play, you can actually use that. Now, also because they're in play, there are also the cards that assassinate these things. So it's a double-edged sword, but this is a way you can sort of have something a, a little bit in limbo. 
Um, but it's also a nice way that you can sort of put them directly onto the board and uh, not have to worry about like summoning sickness. I say summoning sickness is the magic term. What I'm going to do right now, though, is I'm going to play the Wealthy Noble card. What this does is it gives me an extra maximum uh, resource. So next turn, I'm actually going to have three, and I'm going to use that to my advantage, basically, to play as many uh, many as many of these uh, aspirants as I can. Um, now, again, once you're finished sort of planning out your turn, I could I could actually undo this stuff uh, just by this button here, but I do actually want the extra resources, so I'm going to go end my turn, draw a new card. Puffy doesn't do anything because he's a goldfish. So I'm just going to put the aspirants into the uh, onto the playing field, and then I'll play my torchbearer. It says when you play torchbearer, your opponent loses three health, so automatically they take three damage just by me playing this card. And of course, I've got two guys in the assault zone. The goldfish isn't defending itself, so I'm just going to keep piling everything on. Uh, combat will be resolved in the order of the. Um, in the order of each of these uh, units. So, for instance, if there were to be something to defend in the defense zone, the torchbearer would be the first one to sort of bear the brunt of that uh, of that defense. That's why I actually put him in the front line here, because he's got four health, whereas these have two. These are pretty much dead uh, otherwise. So I'll play another one of these, and we will put a Vicious Ransacker. Now, I protect them because the vicious ransacker has the ability which does damage uh, it does damage to the player's fortress sorry let me say that again when this character does damage to the player's fortress and it's eight damage on its own uh, characters in the support zone take three damage so for instance if i were to be hit by one of these things this wealthy noble would be dead and i'd take a hit to my economy I think you kind of get the principle as far as the puffy fight is concerned, so I will just sort of rush through this stuff as much as I can. I'm, I could put these battering rams in because it does 15 damage to the fortress, but I figure I'll just get the foot soldiers out first. Oh, forgot to add this guy to the attack. And that should end the match. There you go, flawless victory. Everybody thinks I'm very powerful. So unsurprisingly, I don't get any experience for beating a goldfish. But you do actually get experience and uh, card drops and things like that for playing against the AI. Or at least you used to. So let's do De Descendants of the Dragon. Uh, they rank them as difficulty too. I don't actually necessarily think it's because they're a bad faction. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use the Flame Dawn again. I'm just going to show you how this faction can actually cause some problems for the Flame Dawn. So this is actually going to be an opponent that will give me uh, or put up some kind of defense. So the thing we'll start by doing is taking a look at what they have in their command zone. First one is uh, Diode, Sage of Strength. This player can play three and exhaust him, so that's just the same as tapping in uh, Magic the Gathering. All characters you control gain plus zero, plus three, and then he becomes exhausted next turn. So basically, you can only do that once every two. But once this, once the dragons actually get up to three resources, this can be a big problem for me, because if I can't actually do the damage to, um, to the player, I'm just going to have this impenetrable wall. Um, the next problem that I run into is the Glorious Warrior. It says, at the end of each turn, if Glorious Warrior is on the battlefield, the opponent loses four morale. So the battlefield means they're in the assault zone or the defense zone. Now just consider, we've got a character here which is going to increase the defense of these creatures by three. This guy already has 12 defense, deals 10 damage, and as long as he's on the battlefield, I'm going to lose four morale. That's a big problem. Um, so I either want to find a way of dealing with him or dealing with him as soon as I can. Finally, there's the Meditating Monk. At the end of each turn, if you were not attacked, the Meditating Monk gains plus two, plus zero. So I don't necessarily want this thing to get any stronger 
uh, at the beginning, so I will make the somewhat foolish decision of attacking with one of my Flame Dawn aspirants right away. The reason I say it's a foolish decision is that the the descendants of the dragon almost always have something they can immediately place into the defense zone, so this guy's probably going to die. No, maybe not. So that basically prevented the uh, meditating monk from gaining some uh, some stats. Ghost of the Ancestors is a flying creature, so there's really not a lot I can do about it. Uh, it could take out my Flame Dawn Aspirant if it wanted by defending, but what it would probably do here is just assault and laugh at me because I can't handle it. Uh, no other cards that cost two to play, so I just play my Nobleman and I end the planning phase. Looks like they're playing another flying creature, so pretty uneventful turn. So now I have two creatures that can actually sort of stand up to these uh, flyers. What I think I want to do instead is I'm going to go a little bit risky and play my Vicious Ransacker directly to the Assault Zone. It's the hope that if they have a defensive character, it's not one that will be able to take out the two of these. May not pay off, might, but the big reason why I want to take this chance is because if it does actually successfully damage the fortress, uh, everything in the support don't zone takes three damage, and so as a result, these two ghosts are immediately eliminated. So, when planning, again plays another monk, and as it happens, my gambit paid off. So I'm actually going to do the same nasty trick because I'm just a bad person. So here they decided to actually use the monk to attack. This is a little bit of a problem for me just because I don't have a natural defender. I'm actually willing to trade blows with this guy though. Um, I might have a little bit of a problem if they decide to use the glorious warrior to uh, hit the defensive zone. It means I probably wind up losing two. Um, but in order to press the advantage, I'm actually going to bring this uh, flame ram inside. Again, the AI sort of has a suboptimal way of playing this game, so this isn't a particularly challenge fight, challenging fight, but I kind of hope um, this is sort of showing the a little bit about how this game works. Yeah, so we decided to commit all in on the assault, which clearly is a suboptimal strategy. He's down to 25 health, and there's nothing really he can do to, to take these guys out. So this is just because I want to be mean. Um, I'm going to play Sekulis, the final hammer, for uh, resources. When he enters the deployed zone, each num uh, sorry, each opponent's fortress takes damage equal to twice the number of characters you currently control. So one, two, three, four, five. Soon to be six. And I can actually play... I'll play a Vicious Ransacker just because I can. So again, I could completely ignore these uh, heroes here just because I already had such an advantage in terms of health that it didn't really matter that my fortress was down to 44. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go up against Genesis Industries, but I'm actually going to play the group that I just played against. And the hammer. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, Descendants of Dragon. So what I'm going to do here is try and show you how the different strategies apply. Flame Dawn is fairly simple. It's just keep hitting them. You really like this game more than Hearthstone? I think it's a really well done game. Again, I, I like both, but I, I honestly think Infinity Wars is a well done and underappreciated game. Um... I hope you get a chance to download it and we can start playing playing together. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to show you what a different faction looks like. The Flame Dawn is fairly simple, pure and simple as a hammer to the forebrain. Um, like, it's just keep pushing and do as much uh, attacking as possible. The way you want to play Descendants of the Dragon is to actually retreat a little bit. Put up a big wall that people can't handle. Now, 
I think this is a suboptimal strategy if you were to get at higher levels of the game, but in this case, I did actually put a wealthy noble in my command center just so I can have that extra resource right away. I sort of justify it for the dra uh, Descendants of the Dragons just so I can have that um, resource advantage early on and just make this impenetrable fortress. Um, Genesis have some tricks that they can play that can cause some problems for this deck, but um, it's the AI. Like, the AI is not intended to be a, a pretty so sophisticated opponent. So this, uh, for instance, uh, this item that I just uh, picked up here, the Great Wall of Jinhai, your characters take two less damage while in the defensive zone. This is a fantastic card to play if you've got, you know, a hundred bruisers coming to hurt you and you've just got a whole bunch of these very tanky creatures to... Uh, to protect yourself. Now what I'm going to do here, I've got a couple options. I can play this defensive character. He's got eight health on his own. Um, and he's sort of the opposite of that Flame Dawn Aspirant. So this one is Vigilance, where he gets played directly to the defensive zone. That's a little too passive uh, for me. What I want to do instead, if this guy's not going to attack, I want to have this Meditating Monk out in play. Because at the end of the turn, if I wasn't attack, he gets plus two, plus zero. So the sooner I can get this guy out here... Uh, the faster he's going to be kind of building up that health. Okay, so I drew a balanced warrior, just 6-6 six, six, for 3. Uh, his power is equal to its remaining health, so he's very strong at the beginning, and as he starts taking damage, he becomes a little bit uh, less worthwhile. Unending Drone is an interesting card. So uh, this is a unique one to the Gen to Genesis Industries. It says, at the start of each turn, Unending Drone raises one other Unending Drone from the graveyard to your support drone. So if you've got two of these things, you send one out to attack and keep one in the support zone. Even though the one that attacked dies, it just comes back the next turn because there's another uh, Unending Drone in the, in the deck. Um, usually you'll see these things completely stacked up. Genesis usually have a lot of cards which will allow them to cannibalize these and buff up their other guys. So, for instance, uh, Aletta the Immortal Tinkerer, uh, pay one exhaust, tar artificial creature gains plus three, plus three. So this is now a plus five, plus five. Then you use Secluded Constructor, play, pay one, sacrifice a deployed artificial character, target character gains the sacrificed character's power and remaining health, an additional plus one, plus one. So this 5-5 five, five creature now adds 6-6 six, six to somebody else, and then his buddy, the other 2-2 two, two unending drone, well, just brings him back to life. So these are the kind of strategies that you can employ. Um, so the requirement for the Meditating Monk, he still gets his plus 2-0 no matter where he is. So I'm just going to move him directly to the Assault Zone. And... I'm going to pay the three. So uh, this one is pay three. Pilgrimage Monk leaves the game for three turns. When she returns, you draw two cards and she gains plus four, plus four. So I'm doing this mostly for the cards, but it's also just because I have a little bit of an advantage in terms of tempo. Uh, this guy's just going to keep getting stronger. Oop, no, he's not because the unending drone is now getting buffed. It's a mild concern here because that's going to be a, uh, a bit of a thorn in my side. One way I can deal with it would be to put up one of my Vigilant characters. I think what I'm going to do instead is put down a Valiant Defender. So he's going to get another free hit, which is not great. And... Can't really use any of these. Yeah, I think I'm just going to hold back for a second. So now I really need to deal with these. Um, what I'll do here is I'm going to start by playing the Great Wall of Jinhai. Now there's a reason why I sort of held off uh, to do that. The Great Wall is going to reduce the two, uh, two damage. So where normally this drone would be able to kill this defender... Uh, assuming that he doesn't get buffed, it's actually going to be uh, 6 damage, which means that he this defender is going to be able to take out this bot. 
Then, next turn, I play this guy. And he'll do the uh, he'll do sufficient damage to take this out. There's not going to be any other unending drones, and so they're going to be left without anything to resurrect. That's the ideal plan, anyway. We'll see whether or not it works. Because uh, I haven't been using my balanced warrior, I'm also going to use him to do some damage in the assault zone. All right, so twenty-seven, twenty-seven is a problem. Of course, the important thing to remember here is it doesn't actually matter that um, it's a 27 creature. As long as I have something to throw in front of it, uh, I don't need to worry. I don't need to worry about uh, about the fact that this is a heavy hitter. So I'll just put another uh, defender up to um, nobly sacrifice himself. I think I'm also going to move the balanced warrior uh, into this side here. Again, the bots are going to come back um, just because that's the way that they work. But um, I figure I might as well limit the amount of damage that I'm taking. Oop, looks like he reorganized. So cleanse the land. Um, this destroys the target location, so I no longer have the Great Wall of Jinhai. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play the Glorious Warrior. This was the uh, one that made you lose morale as long as he was in a combat zone. Uh, one other thing I should mention right now is the strategy I'm employing right now of putting everything into the assault zone is not something I would do in a real life game. Uh, all that the, this opponent would need to do is put the unending drone in the defense zone and all three of these guys die for no reason. But I suspect the AI is not going to do that, so I get away with it. Again, you would, would normally see a human player take uh, a 27-25 creature and not use it. I don't even want to play these things, to be honest, so I'll just hit end planning. Do wind up losing uh, the monk, unfortunately. I should have maybe planned that a little bit better. But I get to do some healthy damage, so... More wealthy nobles, so I'm getting a bit of an economy advantage. Um, this is a an interesting character here, actually. Uh, Ju Lin, who rewrites history. This character cannot deal damage. If Ju Lin would die to a non-sacrifice effect or be removed from the game, instead he returns to the support zone and loses a chapter. At the end of each turn, Ju Lin... Uh, sorry, at the end of the, each turn that he's in the defense zone, he gains a chapter. When Ju Lin has six chapters, you win the game. So if you can keep this guy in your base um, for six turns, you automatically win. Now, these guys are going to whittle down the Genesis on their own, but I'll put them up here just so we can, uh, we can watch. And here I'm just putting up the defenders to make sure that I uh, this guy is protected. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can try and take this guy out. And keep in mind, like, six turns is a fairly long period of time. Um, it's There are definitely some decks that are oriented towards, like, clearing out key, uh, key cards. But um, even if somebody just has this really brutal um, attack, like, keep in mind that this guy costs seven to bring in, so I have a filthy, fairly healthy number of nobles here, which is causing my resources to be 13 out of 13. 
but generally you're looking at seven turns into the game already. So you're finishing the game on the 15th turn. That means you have to have done some pretty impressive stuff to prevent the guy from really being able to take an advantage. Like, to give you an idea of timing, this guy's got the Dragon Project. So pay for exhaust, the Dragon uh, Project becomes an additional 35% complete. When the Dragon Project is 100% complete, it creates a 30-30 artificial dragon with flying and unstoppable. This costs three to play. So basically, on turn number three, they play this. Next turn, they get 34%. Turn five, uh, sorry, 35%. Uh, turn five, they get 70%. And turn six, they now have a 30-30 artificial dragon. Um, so before I can even play this guy, they've got something that will be taking me for almost a third of my health each turn. So there's kind of a balance. But with that in mind, like I definitely have some ways of sort of making uh, making this guy be a be a sufficient pain. I don't think I've ever won with him though. I've always I've what I usually do is I let the threat of this cause my opponent to have to focus on stuff that they don't want to. Um, so this is more so for the. Uh, this is more so for the scare tactic, and then I usually just knock down their their health. Uh, in terms of other cards, um, Disciple of the Mian Monastery. Uh, each turn the Disciple ends in the support zone, he gains plus three, plus three. So the best way you handle this guy is, you know, set up something like this, you know, this unstoppable defense, uh, and then just let this guy hang out, do push-ups, and just become beastly. Um, this is obviously over soon, but yeah, let's give all my characters plus zero, plus three. Jesse Quill's hosting us again. Hello, Jesse Quill's stream. Thank you very much. There are some of you. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, we're playing Infinity Wars now, so uh, if you like Hearthstone, this is a slightly more complicated game it's sufficiently different that you can enjoy both um, but i think this is a game that's uh underloved and a really interesting one to play Okay, for the sake of argument, I'm actually going to roll back. I am going to keep um, the Glorious Warrior in the Assault Zone, but I'm going to move everything else to Defense. And I'll play... No, oh, he's already in play. Okay. Um, I'll play this, which just increases the amount of uh, morale loss. And then this card, which will increase their health by another plus three. As you can see, this deck really is built around this uh, nasty guy. But mostly I'm just kind of drawing this out so I can actually get the sufficient number of chapters up. I'm just going to move the Glorious Warrior out of the... Assault zone. Oh, it looks like they lost by morale. It's basically a suicide run. Okay, but the chapters totally would have worked. So... As you can see, the faction that you pick is actually going to have a bit of a say in terms of um, in terms of how you play the game. I think what I'll do here is I'm going to use the uh, faction that I played against previously uh, against the next one. So Flame Dawn, and I'm going to play Genesis this time. Absolutely, that's a major strength of uh, Infinity Wars is the diversity of the uh, of the cards. Well, the decks, rather. 
So in my command zone, I've got the overloaded soldier where I pay two to get plus two plus two. I've got the secluded constructor. So this is the one where I can sacrifice an artificial character to uh, increase um, the damage. And then there's the kinetically overloaded drone. At the end of the turn, kinetically overloaded drone gets plus one, plus one. So you can sort of see the idea behind this one is just to slowly buff up your characters. Uh, now I'm going to be going up against the Flame Dawn, which is entirely about taking me out as fast as possible. So this is a little bit of a race against the clock for me. Genesis Construct is a very simple 8-8 um, eight, eight character, but it only costs 3 to deploy. So these are really great to feed to secluded con, uh, constructors. What I need to figure out, though, is how I'm going to deal with these uh, creatures. So uh, I'm going to start with Cannon Fire. Now what this does is deal uh, 4 damage to 2 target characters on the battlefield. These are actually not the most optimal targets. There's definitely scarier stuff that you can hit. But uh, in this case here, I have a backup cannon fire. So this is just mostly to get me a little bit of time. And I might as well just move the uh, unending drone. I don't actually have a replacement to resurrect it, but there aren't any defensive characters for the, uh, for the Flame Dawn. It's all offense, so I don't need to worry about any like emergency you know, defensive maneuvers. It looks like they're not giving up, though, so... Okay, so... Mechanics Overseer. If Mechanics Overseer is deployed, all other artificial characters you control get plus one, plus one. So we'll put him down right now just for an extra buff. This is actually probably a little too expensive for what it's worth. Uh, what I am going to do though next turn is just start playing these bad bots. Now this is a 15-15 but the drawback is it cannot attack or block. So what you do is you play the bad bot then you just sacrifice it to buff up your uh, your guys here. Um, I also need to be conscious of the fact that uh, Bromic the field commander is coming up so they're going to be doing an additional two damage. This is actually a game that I might lose because I let him uh, come out into play. Oh, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. So called shot is a neat one. It says choose a zone in the deployed area, kill target character if they're in the chosen zone. So this is where playing against a human being becomes really interesting because I know almost with certainty that the computer is going to play this guy uh, in the assault zone. So I'll call him to be there. But if I was a human and I had the suspicion that somebody had a card like that, maybe I'd move him to the defense zone. Maybe I'd move him to the support zone just to mess with my opponent. So the, because it is uh, simultaneous turns, that's actually what's, in my opinion, what makes this game so interesting. All right. So next... Next thing I need to worry, there's actually two things that I need to Now he's got a Vicious Ransacker on the on the deck. I don't need to worry immediately about, actually, I'm not going to worry at all about it. I'm just going to blow it up. So notice that this is an anticipation of him moving it to the Assault Zone. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, I'm still not doing enough damage, in my opinion, to this... Um, to this area. What I think I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move uh, one of these unending drones just to the defense zone so he can take out one of the uh, aspirants. <laughs> so I'm still whittling away on the health. Unfortunately, they're doing the same to me. So now I need to start being a little bit more uh, more aggressive. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to immediately sacrifice Bad Bot into the Unending Drone. And then I'm going to get him in as a defender. Uh, 
And he plays Call the Crusade, create four, three, four, two Flame Dawn Aspirants in the Assault Zone. They cannot be moved from this zone. So that plus 15, plus 15 isn't going to mean a whole lot in a minute. I mean, it's a nice dent, but I definitely need more defense at this point. So this is Mega Unit 1. Uh, can only attack or block if it has a pilot. Uh, pay 4, remove human from the game to become Mega Unit 1's pilot. When it is killed, the pilot returns to play. And pay 3, deal 6 damage to target character on the battlefield. Play this ability only if it has a pilot. And that's a 24-24 creature. So what I'm going to do again is I'm going to play one of these unending drones. A bad bot. And again, I'm just going to activate to just wipe out this uh, assault group. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is just play as many uh, characters as I can. I'm also going to get a little bit ballsy, and uh, in this case, the mechanics overseer just needs to be deployed. So I'm actually going to move him to the assault zone to speed up this uh, attack on the on their fortress. Also notice that they're um, they're taking a pretty heavy hit to morale uh, with the strategy I'm employing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press my advantage. I'm going to consume the 9-9 nine -nine creature and I'm actually going to move this to my attack zone and I'm going to move the uh, kinetically overloaded drone to my defense zone. Uh, next I will... I'll just put, basically, I just want to put bodies uh, in the way in case they have something particularly nasty for me to deal with. Um, then there is the Angel Phi, which target character becomes plus four, plus four in flying. It gains untouchable for this turn. So again, if you're playing against a regular, uh, a regular player, it's reasonable for them to say, it's like, okay, this thing has got 20 damage, one health. He's going to move it to the assault zone, and then he uses some kind of a, a card to nuke it. So if I play Angel Phi, now it becomes untouchable, which means that anything that they try to use to take this, uh, this creature out, it actually, it gets negated. So this now becomes a 25 damage creature and anything that they use to try and take it out is gonna fizzle. Oh, sorry, 30. Oh, right, because of the, the other thing that I did. Right. Ancient Coil Mechborn. Uh, evolve, pay 2, Agent Coil gains plus 4, plus 4. This ability can only be used once per turn, and I can pay 10. Uh, Agent Coil evolves into a 30-30 dragon with flying and unstoppable. Again, a bit of a moot point just because I have enough now. You know, this 34-15 or this 8-10 guy are going to come barreling through. They only have a 0-8 tank, which isn't going to be able to get through these three characters here, even if they call Call the Crusade. So I'll end planning, and we should be able to sew up this game. Notice the turn does actually take its time to resolve before uh, declaring a winner, but because Flame Dot at 0 and I'm at 22, we still got to turn this one into a win. So as you can see there, Genesis Industries is a little bit more about building up your strengths through buffs as opposed to the uh, Descendants of the Dragons, which are very defense and morale oriented, or the Flame Dawn, which is very much living up to their name. All right, uh, you've received a random reward for completing your first three games of the day, and I gained Steadfast Protector, a card I've never actually seen before. So 